Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I guess you don't need a translation from American English, do you? <laughs> you don't know. You don't know. Yet. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. Pleasure to be here in Newcastle. If you know Pride and Prejudice, yes. Uh, yeah. Wickham came to Newcastle, but anyway. Yeah. So um, today we're going to speak about the body of God, and. Um, It's a difficult topic today. Um, first of all, theology is not like a really popular topic in the world today. It's not like in you know English, in British or American or other universities, everyone just you know wants to major in theology. Um, but in our culture, um, <coughs> modern culture, Western culture. Um, there is a resistance to the idea of God having a form. And so we can analyze this both philosophically, psychologically, culturally. Is there, oh, there is water. <coughs> the idea, for example, that, that, um, that God has a form, a visible form. So, um, where is this resistance mm. coming from? Well, for one thing, it's coming from an interpretation. Oh, you just do it this way. And then can I say it and you also? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, for one thing, um, you could argue that the Western world, for all of its modern secularism and agnosticism, uh, definitely has its metaphysical roots in the in Middle Eastern religion, namely Judeo-Christianity, the Judeo-Christian tradition, which ultimately comes from the Middle East. A fact which actually has a lot of effect on how people think about God. The fact that it did come from. So, first of all, let's. Um, <clears throat> Let's talk about one aspect. We're talking about the body of God. Now, so we could talk about that in different ways. In what is called Hinduism, um, or in the central religious tradition of South Asia. Maybe if you sit a little bit toward that side, that way. He wants to play, or he or she, or that soul wants to play. Yeah. So, If you look at world religions, if you look at the major world religions, by major I mean the ones that have had major impact on world history. So it's a neutral sense of the word major. If you look at world religions, we find that they all come from only two parts of the world. They come from uh, South Asia and the Middle East. So, from the Middle East, we have, uh, in order, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all coming from essentially the same part of the world. And then from India, we have Hinduism, Buddhism, and um, a religion that was at one time a, a much larger, but that's very small, Jainism. So, religions come from these two parts of the world. <clears throat> there is one significant difference between these two parts of the world and this significant difference uh, had a dramatic effect on the types of religions that emerged. Um, if we look at philosophical traditions, and by philosophy here I don't just mean this or that, esoteric view, but I mean by philosophy, or, or let's say even better, a serious philosophical tradition. What I mean is a part of the world where you see people thinking logically, rationally, 
about important aspects of life, such as, for example, political philosophy, not simply imposing a particular form of government, but actually thinking about it, reasoning, arguing, investigating, what is the best way to organize human societies? How should authority be exercised for the greatest good for the greatest number of people? So that's, you can call that political philosophy, or now you know, there's political science. Or for example, ethics. What does it mean to do good? What does it mean to do evil? You know, how should human beings behave if they are to be truly moral creatures? So that's ethical philosophy. That's definitely one of the, is that a doorbell? It's a remarkable doorbell. <laughs> the doorbell that won't quit. So, then for example, Then there's also um, epistemology, from the Greek word episteme. I would suggest uh, yeah, a little adjustment on that. The Greek word episteme means knowledge. And so epistemology means the philosophy of knowledge. In other words, well, how do you know you know? Or under what conditions, under what conditions, in what circumstances are we justified in saying that we don't merely believe something, but we actually know it? And what constitutes valid knowledge? And then, of course, there's ultimately metaphysics. In other words, or ontology, what is the nature of existence itself? And what kinds of real things exist? For example, we see in this world that obviously there's a real thing called matter, you know, good old dead matter. At the same time, you're conscious, and consciousness is not matter. Consciousness has uh, important neurological associations and counterparts, but ultimately consciousness is not your nerve cells, it's consciousness, it's awareness. And therefore, it's a different kind of thing. And that's reflected in the fact that uh, we hold that certain material facts are objective. For example, that Newcastle is north of London, or that water boils at a certain temperature. There are certain physical facts of the world, but we also hold that there are certain metaphysical facts of the world, such as that uh, all people, regardless of their different abilities, uh, are somehow equal equal in dignity, equally entitled to justice, for example. And so, the belief in justice, the belief in equality, these are not physical facts. There is no, physically, there is no physical fact in the world, there is no empirical fact in the world that we're all equal. It's a metaphysical fact. So therefore, because there are physical facts and metaphysical facts, we actually live in a bi-dimensional universe. And so why is this the case? Why is it, although, you know, a lot of people, anyway, there's not a lot of philosophical common sense nowadays, why, you know, why be rational when you could be buying a new iPhone? So, anyway, metaphysics, or ontology, is the branch of philosophy that's concerned with understanding what is existence, what kinds of existence are there. So this is philosophy. And when people pursue reasonable, uh, logical knowledge of these fields of life, and they do so in a systematic, organized way, that's called philosophy. You know, that, that is a... Now, what's interesting is that original philosophical traditions, in other words, it, not just it came from somewhere else, but original philosophical traditions only arose in this world in two places which are India and Europe. If you look at the Muslim world, for example, they, the Muslim Renaissance actually occurred before the European Renaissance, mm -hmm. and it was based on the discovery of classical knowledge, Greco-Roman knowledge, and the Islamic world at its height when it was actually learned and the Western Europeans were terrorists, uh, which actually there was a time like that. Um, it was based on 
uh, Southern European philosophy, Greco-Roman philosophy. Even when, for example, Buddhism went to China, China has wisdom traditions, such as Confucius and so on, but does not have an, an original indigenous tradition of systematic philosophy. India does, and Europe did. When Buddhism went east to various places, such as China and Japan, it, it, it brought with it a sophisticated philosophical vision that came from India. Well, but there, this is the point I'm getting at regarding the body of God. And that is, in civilizations that have powerful philosophical traditions, they don't simply reject the idea of a body of God. The people that reject the idea of God having a form tend to be not the traditions that are more intellectual or philosophical, but the traditions that aren't. And I'll, I'll explain that. It's just like, for example, it's, it's the traditions that are not philosophical that tend to reject what they call idol worship. I guess it's good to be an idol if you're, if you're a musician, but not if you're a deity. Mm -hmm. Like a teen idol. I'm a teen idol in the sense that there are at least seven teenagers in the world that listen to my classes. So <laughs> anyway, so, so what is it what is this all about? Take matter, for example, the idea that you don't make an image a graven image of God, which is thought to be one of the Ten Commandments. Actually, what the commandment really says, if you go back to the original Hebrew, is that you should not make graven images of many gods. In other words, you should not make polytheistic images. It doesn't explicitly say not of God. But apart from that, um, why this injunction against any kind of visible image of God? I mean, clearly the reason is a, a belief that somehow matter, because if you make an image of God, you make it out of, you know, metal or earth or what or stone. So the idea that matter is somehow profane, it's, it's not evil, and some people thought it was evil, the matter is somehow so hopelessly material that it's, it's completely, not only inappropriate, but offensive to think that somehow you can have some kind of divine presence in something as unspiritual as matter. Therefore, somehow, a visible image is an, is an offense to God, or a, a, a degrading of God, by proposing that God is somehow material. Um, Interesting idea, but even if you look at the Old Testament, um, you have cases of God appearing in material forms. For example, Moses saw a bush that was burning but didn't consume itself, and then he realized, whoops, that's actually God. So, of course, God spoke into the bush. So, um, in philosophy, here's the difference between philosophical and non-philosophical civilizations. In a non-philosophical or pre-philosophical culture, it's just what is matter, like this table or this, anything, it's, it's just matter. It's not spiritual, it's just dead matter. But in a philosophical civilization, you ask the question, which by the way, scientists also ask, and that is, what is matter? What is matter ultimately? You know, we can touch it and taste it and smell it and see it and hear it and all that. But ultimately, what is it? Now, as soon as you ask that question, you're going beyond, you're going beyond the surface of reality. And you're actually trying to understand something at a deeper level. Whether you take the path of science or whether you take the path of philosophy, you are not satisfied with the surface. And people who are satisfied on the surface of life don't ask these questions. So now what you find, both in Greco-Roman philosophy, especially Neoplatonism, people like Plotinus, in the West, and also, of course, in India, and all the great Vedanta traditions, is the understanding that ultimately matter, what we call matter, is ultimately the energy of God. It's the energy of God. And so, the issue is not, can God appear in some kind of infinitely inferior kind of creepy energy like matter which has nothing to do with God and is completely separate from him or can God appear within his own energy because if matter ultimately is God's energy can he appear within that energy 
Interestingly, the environmental crisis of today is related to the rejection of deity worship. In this sense, hey, got your attention. In the sense that, what is the basis of the environmental crisis? Basically, a disrespecting the material world, not respecting nature. Even if you look in animistic societies, you know, they, they have a notion that, that the material world is actually enchanted. If you look at you know, the so-called most primitive societies, they understand that there are there's a divine presence throughout nature. For example, there are Amazon tribes that uh, you know we would consider them extremely simple by our standards. And yet, if they want to cut a tree down to carve out a canoe, because they need <coughs> canoes in certain places, um, you can't. They can't just do it. They actually have to get permission from the goddess who rules the forest, and then they can cut a tree down and make a canoe. And obviously, you can't ask too much from the goddess. But they have a sense that they are in a world on a planet that really belongs to someone else. And therefore you have to be respectful. Here's another example from a more culturally advanced civilization, namely southern India. Uh, we have texts from southern India, ancient Sanskrit texts, where when, uh, let's say, people decide to build a temple, say Vaishnavas decide to build a temple, uh, as you know, when you build a building, you've got to level the land. You've got to prepare the land to build. So in those days, they didn't have tractors, so they leveled land with plows. They special, you know, leveling plows. Now, since they're going to build a temple for God, a house of God, you don't want to use the same dirty plow you used for everything else, so you have to build a new plow. To build a special new plow, to prepare the land for God's house, you've got to cut a tree down. Now, trees are actually the centers of communities. A tree is the center of an entire community. I mean, there are birds, squirrels, insects. There, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands, of creatures whose life is centered around a shade tree. And therefore, when you cut a tree down, you're not only killing a tree, you are actually destroying, in a sense, or, or seriously disrupting and displacing an entire living community. And so therefore, when cutting the tree down, the people who were doing it had to acknowledge all the harm they were doing in order to do some good and apologize and sincerely pray for the well-being of all the creatures whose lives have been either terminated or seriously disrupted by this act. And that's just for cutting a tree down. As we know, modern paper, you know, I mean, just to produce junk mail, use the term junk mail, yes, yeah, that's what it is. I mean, millions and millions and millions of trees were cut down and no one gives a damn. I mean, people couldn't care less. So like, cut it down, okay, that row right there. You know, it's, there's no question of any concern. It's just kill them all, cut them all down. So, so if you ask the question, what is matter and, and, and what is really going on in the world? Oh, I know, so I was making the point that if you think that matter, if you, if, you, if you live in a material world that's totally disenchanted, in other words, there's no divine life in nature, there's nothing there, there are no souls, there's no God, it's just a bunch of dead matter, cut it down, bulldoze it. We actually, I have to say I'm very honored to tell you that in my country we have a barbarian who thinks like that. Anyway, who's now... Anyway, it's comforting to be in another country right now. So, although you have your problems. <laughs> so it's, it's that attitude of just like trashing nature, disrespecting nature that caused the environmental crisis. But it's that same idea, that denigrating of nature, that nature is nothing, that leads to the conclusion that you can't have deity worship because God can't appear in any kind of apparently material form. First of all, we don't know what matter is, so we don't really know what we mean when we say something's material. We actually don't know what we're talking about because we don't know ultimately what matter is. But it's that same attitude of denigrating the natural world that led to the idea that you should never, that God could never appear in the natural world. 
that somehow God is absolutely separated from the natural world. So whatever obligation we have toward God, it is not an obligation toward the natural world. Respecting God does not require us to respect the natural world. So there's obviously a link between, and, and this is not just my idea, uh, all kinds of environmental scholars, philosophers have come to the same conclusion that this attitude toward the natural world that's led people to reject God's presence in the natural world led them to trash the natural world. So, that's one aspect of the body of God. I mean, obviously, we don't really believe that God's made out of metal like something out of the Wizard of Oz, you know, the deity of Oz. Follow the yellow brick road to Krishna or something. So, I mean, you know, even though we're already Christians, we actually know that God's not made out of metal. <laughs> even we know that. You know, God's not made out of metal. He's not made out of wood or this or that. However, he can appear in that form. He can manifest his presence. For example, let's say you're doing a Skype call. Now, someone could say, you are really crazy because you're talking to a computer screen. Right? I mean, if someone really has like long conversations with computer screens, they need help. <laughs> Get help for that person. <laughs> but when you're doing a Skype call, you're not talking to the computer screen, you're talking to the person who is not technically in the screen. I mean, your friends don't really live inside your computer. And so what are you doing? You're talking to someone who really is somewhere else, who's really a full person, three-dimensional person, and yet you're talking to your computer screen. Because somehow your friend is there. It's actually kind of mystical. If you really think about it, it's, it's, a, little, it's a little more complicated than I have thought of philosophically. So in the same way, if you can talk to computer screens, we can talk to deities. And, and just as your friend is and isn't on the computer screen, Krishna is and isn't in the deed. I mean, he's, he, Krishna's here. But at the same time, Krishna's somewhere else. So again, when you take that leap into rational human life and actually start thinking about these things a little more carefully, uh, you know, everything isn't exactly what it seemed to be. Now, let's talk about a body of God, not simply in a form in this world, like, it, you know, Krishna's giving us a break, okay, I'll appear on your screen. But what about, what about God actually having an eternal spiritual form? So, so, we talk about God having an eternal spiritual form, uh, there are some usual arguments which are, are not tremendous. They don't, they don't take my breath away. But, for example, one argument against God having an eternal form is that form itself is limiting. After all, if you consider, take, for example, the spatial perimeter of this metal cup. We are, Hare Krishna's are so cool, we have metal cups. <laughs> I mean, it's worth joining the movement just to... You know, <coughs> To get metal cups. Anyway, so if you look at this cup, if you look at the spatial perimeter of this cup, the spatial perimeter of this cup, it defines where the cup ends and something else begins, like an inside. It's like a, like a magician, you know. <laughs> See that? <laughs> anyway, if you look inside this cup, it's air. I mean, there's air and then there's cup. So, by definition, a spatial boundary, a spatial ba uh, uh, perimeter defines the limits of the spatial extension of any object. And so therefore, if God had a body, God's body would define the limits of God. Like, God ends here, and, you know, a brick wall starts there, or, or something else. And so if you believe that God is infinite, that's the usual take on God. You know, that God is infinite, God is unlimited, then how could God be spatially limited? <clears throat> so, that argument it ultimately, I think, fails because 
in many theologies, including Krishna consciousness, uh, God is actually all pervading. So Krishna is everywhere. This is like spiritual physics. For example, Krishna says in the Gita, is there a volume switch on? I mean, it's a beautiful little baby, but he's actually preaching for this philosophy. Anyway, so. <laughs> I actually understand what the baby's <laughs> For example, Krishna says in chapter 9 of the Bhagavad Gita that I am in everything and everything is in me. Now, according to ordinary physics, it's simply not possible that you are in this room and the room is in you. I mean, it's just not possible. A cannot simul... It's not possible that at the same time, the same relevant sense, according to the same relevant laws of nature, that A is in B and B is in A. It's simply not possible. But that's the case with Krishna. So, when we talk about a spiritual form, that is everywhere at all times, where is the limit? If you say, well, it's this shape and not that shape, and therefore, like, it's not a hexagon, you know, God is really everything, God should be hexagonal as much as he's pentagonal or human-like. I mean, you say, so therefore, you know, how can you limit God? Or maybe he's a rhombus. <laughs> you know what that is, a rhombus? It's kind of... It's a bit homely, but it's still you know, part of geometry. Anyway, so the idea is that everything is within Krishna, so all forms are within Krishna. Even as he has a specific form, all forms are within him, and he's within all forms. And so, finally, um, one more point which I always bring up, if you look at... Uh, there was, there was an ancient Greek, I guess you'd call it mystic philosophical community. Greeks had all kinds of little mystic things going on. But they were called the Orphics. They, they worshipped Orpheus. And um, they had a very interesting notion of form. They said, not that form is limiting, but that form actually breaks down limits. And to give examples, this is a rerun for some of you, I guess, that have heard this. But for example, take language. If I just make nonverbal sounds, and what if, like, you know, I, I've given a really nice introduction? <laughs> I was impressed when I heard the introduction. I was thinking, oh my God, it's just me. So, <laughs> but what if I sat down here and just started engaging in nonverbal communication, like I started grunting or howling or you know, making other obnoxious noises? And, you know, no words, just like, <laughs> like that. So, probably at first people think, okay, this is like a really clever way to start a lecture. What's it? And then you realize, oh my God, there is no lecture. He's, just, he's still making these noises. And people would understand that, you know, I was having a type of psychotic episode. <laughs> anyway, but fortunately that's not happening. But my point is that if you take vocal sound, sound which we produce by our vocal system, it's, it, 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 if you just grunt or how, it doesn't mean that much. The semantic content, that means, you know, how much meaning is there in it, is, is very little. But when I start to shape sounds into phonemes, which are the smallest units of, you know, language. Like, so, like, for example, the word be, as in a be in your bonnet, or to be or not to be. Actually, I hate to say this, but the most famous line in English literature is a mistake. To be or not, because the first point of Bhagavad Gita is to be or not to be, that is not the question. <laughs> anyway, in the simple word be, <clears throat> there are two phonemes, namely the B sound and the E, the vowel. So the phoneme is the smallest possible unit of recognizable sound. So, I'm speaking English right now, and you're listening, and so you may just think like, okay, he's talking. But the fact is, if you do a computer or mathematical analysis of speech, it's fantastically complex. It's, un it's, it's almost inconceivably complex. 
in terms of grammar, syntax, the order of the words, and em you know the emphasis or, or, or even facial expression. When you analyze his grammar, it actually turns out to be impossibly complex, and yet we just communicate. So that means that with grammar, in other words, grammar is kind of like the structure of language. With grammar, we are actually shaping sound. We are producing sounds, their vocal system, and shaping them through language. And the more you can shape sound, the greater your vocabulary, the greater your expression, the greater you can express. So your the amount of communication you can do dramatically expands as you shape language. So therefore, removing the structure of language does not increase meaning, it actually destroys it. I mean, the same thing is true, for example, if you're a sculptor and uh, you take a block of stone, of course this applies to, I think, to traditional sculptors that actually sculpt things that normal people can recognize. But, but if, let's say you take a stone or something, and you sculpt something, you're giving meaning, you're expanding the value and the meaning of it by forming it, by, by shaping it. <coughs> the same is true for organizations, I mean, precision. I mean, you, you can give unlimited examples, but the idea that form is limiting, the idea that form is limiting is uh, an unthinking assumption. You have to think about it more. So, but, but what about, I mean, here's one more, I'm going to throw one more thing on the table here, not literally, I'm not, but consider children, little children, like the one I just expelled from my, from the class. Much, <laughs> just cruelly expelled. If you consider children, say in, in, in elementary school, in England do they say grammar school? Grammar schools are different yeah. schools. Oh. They have grammar schools and then state schools. So in America, actually, when I, when I was growing up, grammar school and then like primary school. State school and grammar school. Yeah. So in, in, in school, with little people. Um, <laughs> primary, primary schools. Yeah, primary schools. You know, when the kids draw pictures or at home, they draw pictures. One very interesting feature of child art is that everything is personal. You know, houses have smiling faces. Definitely a face on the sun or the moon. But, you know, everything is everything is a person. Everything is a person. Now, we can ask, ask the simple question. This is a point actually I was developing when I was in, in, in Israel when I was there a month ago. And that is, um, there are two possibilities here. Either we, who are cognitively mature, you know, we see the world as it really is. We understand children are just kind of like these cute little delusional beings who think that they're smiling faces, you know, the sun and moon and houses and trees. Or, there's another possibility that actually they are seeing the world as it really is and somehow we lost our power to see it. Now, if we wanted to explore that second option, um, and we, we, and we even, bless you. <laughs> I hope no one else will sneeze in my class. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know why they say bless you or help or something when people sneeze? I learned this from a Superman comic when I was a kid. I was a serious comic book fan when I was a kid. But anyway, um, because when you sneeze, your whole body stops. Your breathing, your heart, everything stops. So people hope you come back. You start reading your blessing. Yes. Actually, one time Superman had to fly off to save someone, but he was with someone else and he was Clark Kent. So what he did is he made the person sneeze, and then in the split second when their eyes closed, he went and saved the person that came back as Clark Kent. <laughs> okay, back to our, back to our main program. Um, so when children, you know, when a child's body grows, we go through a, period, a, 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 a transition called, you know, puberty or whatever. And so what actually happens? Uh, we develop sex desire. Because when the body becomes mature, 
that sort of reproductive urge or just the urge to gratify the body a certain way, it just naturally develops. Now, interestingly, when that develops, it clouds consciousness in the sense that, because this gets into a, a very common postmodern philosophical point, the difference between the you know, objectifying people and seeing them as persons. Now, objectifying a person means, it doesn't mean seeing them objectively, it's actually a negative term. To objectify someone means that rather than see them as they really are, every person is actually a subject. Every person is a center of their own personal life and of their own consciousness. But I, if I see someone as an object of my pleasure, whatever that pleasure may be, sexual, political, whatever, you know, economic. If I see someone as an object of my pleasure, I'm degrading them from a subject to a mere object. They only exist to gratify me, and if they do not gratify me, they have no value. All of that person's value is calculating, calculated according to how much they can gratify my wishes. So that's what is meant by objectifying someone. And actually, the, the Bhagavatam talks about that. Evam drashtari drishyatvam aropi dhamma The Bhagavatam explicitly talks about this most modern idea. The Bhagavatam, the first canto, says that people who lack intelligence, literally who lack reason, they impose upon the seer the quality of being the seen. In other words, this, that's how they say subject-object in ancient Sanskrit. Uh, Drashta or drashta means the seer, in other words, the subject, the person who is seeing. Whereas drishya is the, is the object of my seeing. So therefore they say we impose upon a seer, a subject, the status of being merely the object of my seeing. So, now obviously when one develops sex desire, uh, it almost forces an ordinary person to see another person as an object. Because suddenly you have these very strong desires, which are, you know, kind of primitive and basic, what Plato called the id, it. And, and so in a sense you lose the power to see another person as a subject. Because when you are when your own personal desire is very strong and you, and you think that this person can wonderfully gratify my desire, then you're trapped in, this, in seeing that person as an object, not a subject. The same thing happens, for example, when you're greedy, you really want money. So I meet you and, hi, how are you? Yeah, have I got a deal for you. It's, um, anyway. So if you're greedy for money and you meet someone, you're just thinking, deal or no deal? You know, can I sell it to this person? So rather than seeing that person like, who is this person? What are their needs? What are their desires? What's best for this person? It's just, how do I get my hand in their pocket and get the money out? You know, it's, it's like, do you have the same kinds of car salesmen in America, in the UK that we do? Or are yours like very ethical and... <laughs> they sincerely care about your well-being. <laughs> no? No. A bit more polished. A bit more polished here. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, so, I remember when Richard Nixon was running for president, and of course all the students were against him, they were all liberal and everything. Although he actually stopped the war in Vietnam. But anyway, so during the campaign, this, there was this poster you see everywhere, especially among young people, college students. It was like a picture of, you know, Richard Nixon, the face of it. And under it said, would you buy a used car from this man? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so if you're trying to get money from someone, if you're trying to get sexual satisfaction, if you just want someone to like you, like, you know, maybe you want to be more popular and you want people to like you, if you want someone to vote for you, whatever it may be, the stronger your desire, the more impossible it is for you to see that person as a subject. And the more that person becomes an object of your desire. Therefore, therefore, um, 
as you reach puberty and as sex desire increases, you begin to lose the po your power to see the world objectively. You become more self-centered. You become more vain. You begin to identify more strongly with your body. You get into the whole mirror, mirror on the wall syndrome. And what's interesting about that is that the more attached we are to our body, the more attached we are to our bodies, the more impossible it becomes to think of a completely different kind of body. Because the more attached you are to something, the more that becomes your reference point. So the idea of a, of a spiritual body, or a divine body, God's body, a spiritual body for souls, becomes harder and harder to imagine because you become more and more absorbed in thinking, body, my body, because you're so attached, you're so completely absorbed in your body. So, again, getting back to the question, you know, are we seeing the world as it really is and children just like these cute little deluded creatures? Or are they seeing, you know, I'm not saying there's literally a smiling face on the sun, but are they somehow connected to a cosmic reality? Even if they express it in a childish way, that really the world is full of light, that there is consciousness everywhere. There is consciousness everywhere. And that somehow or other, there are souls everywhere, even things that, that are not human. So, um, interestingly, in terms, we all know how the modern world is, well, you know, you have your own problems here, we have our problems. Although we have a bona fide barbarian. You may just have an incompetent leader. We have a true barbarian. <laughs> so, you know, America first. <laughs> But the point here is that obviously you cannot have a moral society unless people respect each other. And yet the more lusty people are, the less they can truly respect each other because the more they just see each other as possible instruments of their gratification. So when you have a society that just promotes through advertising, through you know, pseudo-culture, entertainment, and products that, that simply are meant to stimulate people's lust, to arouse people, like everywhere you turn, there's something to arouse sex desire. You could, you know, Google, I don't know, Girl Scout cookies, and there's an ad for pornography. <laughs> so it's, I mean, I mean, the obvious result of all of this is that as people become more and more greedy and lusty, they less and less can actually respect each other. It, it, it's just a simple psychological ratio. The more they become self-centered and, and, and so it's actually barbarizing the world. It's, it's degrading the world in the name of free enterprise. And if you say like, well, who makes the rules? It's funny because sometimes you, you hear some people say, well, you can't impose your values on others. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever heard that? Mm -hmm. People that say that really um, it's an amazing thing to say because if we shouldn't impose values on others, how do we justify a law against murder? I mean, technically, saying you can't murder people, that's a value. That's a value. It may be a correct one, but it is a value. And so when a country passes a law against murder, they are imposing their values on all the citizens. A law against rape is imposing values. When you put up a stop sign, for God's sake, you're imposing your values. Because let's say you're in a small town, and you put up a stop sign. Less freedom, more security. Take down the stop sign, more freedom, less security. Security and freedom are competing values. And so if you put up a traffic light or a stop sign, you're imposing your value. You have chosen greater security and, and less freedom. So every law there is, every rule, is the imposition of a value. And we shouldn't impose our values, then we should have anarchy. But since anarchy is completely unnatural, we would have to impose it by having a, an anarchy maintenance committee, which would begin to look like a government. So you know, thinking is 
not like a really popular activity nowadays. <laughs> so therefore, the question is, which values to impose? Because you will impose values. You can't not impose values and have civilization. But in any case, getting back to God or Krishna, uh, the body of God, um, there's another argument against the body of God. Or a God especially God having a human-like body, especially us being made in God's image. And this is the uh, psychological projection argument. That we are just projecting onto a God, which you know, may not even exist, it may just be there's nothing out there. So we are somehow imagining there's a God, or even if there is a God, we're projecting onto that God our own human nature. In fact, the first gentleman to give this argument was a man named, um, not Empedocles, uh, oh my God, what's his name? Anyway, pre-Socratic Greek philosopher, Xenophanes. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> Xenophanes. You know, say like, uh, you know, I can put a sign in my car, honk, if you like Xenophanes. Anyway, so Xenophanes gave the argument that, hey, look everybody, let's get real here. If you look at Greek gods, they look like Greeks. If you look at Egyptian gods, they look like Egyptians. If you look at Thracian gods, uh, they look like Thracians, and so on. And then, and then he thought he was being like incredibly clever. He probably was the life of, life of, life of all the parties he went to. Oh. Oh, thank you. It's actually. Oh, thank you very much. Charity is my old friend from Rodney. So then, and, and I think what Xenophanes thought was just an incredible stroke of wit. He said that if I think he said of lions and oxen, maybe horses or elephants or whatever, if they had hands and could draw pictures, we'd find gods that look like oxen and you know horses and all that. So this is basically, at least in its first articulation, the projection argument, that we're just projecting our own experience, our own identity onto a so-called God. Now, there's a problem with this argument. Obviously this argument is, uh, has serious problems, logical problems. It's not that it's wrong because it goes against Hare Krishna teachings. No, I mean it's wrong because, because it's illogical. <coughs> First of all, let's consider the phenomenon of psychological projection. For example, let's look at the history, let's say look at the history of European art, including England. Does European mean England nowadays? <laughs> okay, let's look at the history of European and English art. So, not only that, let's look at the history of, of painting and the history of the painting of trees. Like, let's look at trees in European artwork, let's say during the Middle Ages, or during the Renaissance, or during the 1600s, 1700s, all the different periods, you know, modern periods, Impressionism, and this and that and whatever. Let's look at the whole history of European art, how they painted trees. Now, what, of course we're going to find that every artist, every age, every even geographic regions, you know, French artists, English artists, they are imposing on trees something of their own culture, something of their own psychology. And yet, it would be ridiculous to conclude that therefore, there are no real trees. The fact that the artist is seeing trees or painting trees through his own or her own cultural, psychological filters, therefore we prove that trees don't exist. That's the Nophanes' argument. You know, how could there be a god with form if Egyptian gods look at Egyptians? I mean, what's the difference between saying, what if there are real gods, or devas, or whatever word you want, in other words, just higher beings with higher consciousness who manage the universe. By the cosmic bureaucracy. Now, if that's the case, then of course Greeks will think they're Greek or Egyptians will think they look like Egyptians. Just like, for example, there's the Scandinavian Jesus, which is popular in North Europe and <laughs> North America. You know, the Scandinavian Jesus, sort of the 
Adonis Jesus. And there's the African Jesus, and there's the Latino Jesus. There's basically everything except the Palestinian Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Since there aren't many Christians there anymore, and so they don't. Anyway. But the point is, we know that Jesus really existed. Why? Because there are third party contemporary Roman historians that say, yeah, there's really a guy from Nazareth, and he's preaching, and his friends claim, his followers claim that he's a miracle worker. And these are, you know, basically contemporary reports. So, the fact that you project something of yourself, say, for example, a mother that has ten children, each child sees the mother through his or her own psychological filter. Every child sees the mother in their own unique way, and yet the mother really exists. The mother really exists. Another significant point is that, in fact, horses and oxen and so on do not have hands and do not paint pictures. Elephants actually paint their trunk a little bit. But, but they don't paint like realistic portraits, and therefore the fact that we alone on earth despite all our atrocities, have the power to conceive of God, does that tell us something? In other words, if we're the only species that has the power to do so, perhaps we may sometimes be good at it. Or, what if there's a God who is not, uh, how do you call it, emotionally unhealthy, as God is often depicted, or a serial torturer? I mean, I mean what if there's what if there is a God who's actually psychologically healthy, which would be kind of a new idea? What if there's a God who's like a nice guy, and, or a nice lady, or both, or whatever, and actually wants to communicate with us? Like some traditions say, well, no one has seen God, and no one can see God. God would be a total nut in that case. <laughs> because I imagine if you're a mother or father, and you have a child, and you say, my child shall never see me. You know, I will conceal myself forever from my own child. That is sick. <laughs> I mean, it's just sick. I mean, why, why would a loving parent do that? <laughs> so, um, John Stuart Mill, the British philosopher, said, I cannot worship a God who is morally inferior to human beings. So let's say that God is not morally inferior to human beings. He's not like burning with jealousy. He doesn't torture his own children forever for somewhat subtle theological mistakes. Or he doesn't hide forever from his own children. In other words, he actually is psychologically healthy. In that case, if, when you love someone, you want that person to see you, right? When you love someone, you want, you want to see them and you want them to see you. And so if it's the case that God wants to appear to us, we just have to be qualified, then, then it's possible. Anyway, I mean, there's so much to be said that we're just sort of scratching the surface here of theology. That will be my indication to stop. So, <laughs> anyway, the topic of the body of God is actually a serious philosophical and theological topic, and it's not just for kind of like knuckle-dragging true believers. It, it's a serious topic. So any questions on this? Feel free at any time to come forward with our can very you, large donations. Can you summarize <laughs> what is being said? What's that? Can you summarize what is being said? Uh, <laughs> after traveling all day. You can oh, watch. The, yeah. You can rewatch the lecture yeah. online. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we'll give you a free, free copy of this lecture. <laughs> yes. I'm not clear if we are saying that um, Krishna has the human form. It's not very clear to me if he has got the human form with the, the senses and um, awareness and uh, mind and intelligence and all intelligence and all that. Is it a you you say that he has got a, a true human form? Or is it a spiritual form? Spiritual. A spiritual form which we cannot perceive, or we are just interpreting the spiritual form in a human form. And another thing is that the same way 
In other religions also, they talk about one supreme. And uh, are they talking about the same supreme? Yeah, that's the easy one. Yes, of course. Actually, throughout the history of Indo-European civilization, well, European when it wasn't kind of poisoned by fanaticism, um, there was the understanding that there's one God that appears in different ways. For example, Alexander the Great uh, had a project he called the One World Project. And that was, he wanted to unite all the people of the world. That's why, you know, the two great empires that he was aware of were, I, I guess, you know, there was the Greek world that he conquered and there, there was a the Persian Empire. And so he married uh, uh, an Eastern princess. And he wanted his generals to marry Eastern wives because he wanted to unite cultures. And of course he knew that religious fanaticism would, you know, basically create the crazy world we have today. And therefore, he was pushing what we would call a religious syncretism. The idea that, even though we may call God different names or worship in different ways, there's only one God. The Romans totally embraced this idea. The Romans totally embraced this idea. And uh, even the Roman Emperor, for example, would, would send donations to the different major religions in the empire to have worship done in the name of the, the empire. Because it was the idea that you know, divine power comes through different channels. In fact, if you look at the great Roman historian Tacitus, which was roughly a contemporary of Jesus, maybe just like, you know, maybe, maybe one or a half generation later, he was a Roman senator, he actually knew what was going on, and he's a famous historian. And Tacitus writes this very cosmopolitan, he's considered a great historian even today. And, but then his tone kind of changes at the end of his writing. He gets really sort of heavy, and, and he warns the Romans that if fanatical Middle Eastern religions spread in our civilization, it will ruin our civilization. He thought that, that, that a real threat to civilization, as they knew it, to liberal, open civilization, was fanatical religion. Specifically, he mentions coming from the Middle East, by which he meant, you know, the Abrahamic religions. And so, um, now if you look at India, in the oldest Sanskrit literature, which would be the Rig Veda, you find the statement that there's one absolute, or God, but different worshippers, different thinkers, invoke that God with different names, but it's the same truth. So India always understood. And frankly, in Europe it was understood. And interestingly, now, with a sort of, with the um, waning of fanatical religion in the West, uh, Europe is basically returning to its original eclectic culture or, 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 or syncretic, where the recognition, respect of all, you know, that God is present in many places. So that, regarding the body of Krishna, I, mean, I don't remember all the questions you asked, but um, take our human form. I mean, obviously, I don't think Krishna has like you know kidneys and a liver and you know bowel movements and all that. But 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 the point is that if you take the form itself, from an artistic point of view, I mean, just the form itself, um, we are so used to it. We we are so totally totally conditioned to you know think, you know we're human beings. This is what a human being looks like that it's, we can't imagine that rather than this human form, that, that maybe this human form actually has a divine origin. <clears throat> Not that God has a human material body, but the form itself. Now even if, even let, let, let's say for example we take some form of evolution of, of species, which the Bhagavatam, by the way, doesn't reject. The Bible, there's even a verse in the Bhagavatam that talks about creatures in the water coming to the land and then so, and so on. So, but first of all, if you look at the theory of evolution, uh, it doesn't at all require or even suggest that there's no intelligent designer. The, the, the fossil record does not even suggest that. So even if, let's say, let's say the fossil record with significant anomalies, significant unexplained anomalies, but let's say basically we see a general trend that we see 
Older forms are more simple, later forms are more complex. Uh, that in no way indicates that things, the lack of ultimate engineering. For example, let's say you're building a house. The fact is that an architect makes a plan, the architect collaborates with you know, a structural engineer, and, and the plan is completed. Then you, know, you get your building permits, you get your legal approval, and then you can build it. Now when you actually go to build the house, if you study the sequence, the chronology of construction, in fact, it goes from simple to complex, right? You start with the foundation, you dig a foundation, you lay the foundation, you put up the wall. So it's, even though the actual building goes from simple to complex, the original fact is the complete house in its final form, which actually informed and guided the simple to complex construction. Now that's what Aristotle calls the final cause. Aristotle had a system of four causes. And the final cause means that that which something is ultimately going to be causes the evolution of a simpler thing to become that thing. For example, if you take, a, if you example, take an acorn, you know, like you see in cartoons, there's so many cartoons with squirrels with acorns, but anyway. So if you take an acorn, you could say there is inside the acorn a complete program for an oak tree. Now, that, that complete form of the oak tree, even though it's not yet manifested, but the program is there. And in fact, it's the final state of the oak tree that causes the seed to grow into a stem and develop in a certain way. So, the, or for example, let's say, again, let's say you want to build a house. And so you, you have an architect, you have a, maybe a landscape engineer, you have a you know, building engineer and everything. And you come up with a final plan. That plan is the cause of everything else that happens. When someone comes to dig a foundation, when someone comes to pour cement in the foundation, etc. All those activities are caused by the final plan. The ultimate form of the house is causing all those other activities to take place in a certain way. Because if the plan was different, the building would be different. So in that way, the fact that even if on Earth, let's say we find the oldest fossil records are more simple, the later ones are complex, considering the ultimate complexity, the most rational explanation would be that there in fact is a final plan, there is an Aristotelian final cause, and that ultimate plan is what causes the evolution to take place. And that's what Aristotle means by final cause. So in that sense, um, the, the human-like form, uh, do we project it upon a God that has no form? Or are we made in the image of God? Did the Bible get that one right? Of course, that doesn't mean that God has a physical form. It's simply we're talking about a general idea. And why is it, for example, why is it that in the human body, let's say people fall in love. Let's say, you know, a man and woman fall in love, deeply in love. In fact, if, especially if that man and woman are on the path to enlightenment, then within that human form, you know, looking into each other's eyes, or embracing, or, you know, I'm not going to go past that. So, <laughs> don't worry. So, but I'm saying, in that human form, they feel completely satisfied. Even if, if you, even if you're a, a serious spiritual practitioner, even if you have Krishna consciousness, still, in your human body, it is possible to express profound love. And in fact, what a person doesn't feel is, if I only had a different kind of body, I could really love you. No. I mean, it's, so what I'm saying is, the reason is because it's natural for the soul. It is na some things are unnatural. For example, some things cause us anxiety, frustration, 
you know, we think like, uh, this is just not right. I don't want to be here. You know, I, we have to get out of this place. That was one song. But in a human body, engaging in human activities, embracing with the arms, walking, speaking, you can come to a state where you feel completely natural, completely natural, and fulfilled, even if you're in spiritual consciousness. Why? Because a human-like body is natural for the soul. It's actually natural for the soul. Whereas activities which are not natural for the soul at a particular point must become frustrating. You have to feel you're being blocked in, you're suffocating, I can't really express myself. And, and so when you feel the particular situation, experience, relationship, is just, you know, it's, it's really keeping me back, it's frustrating me, it's not natural for the soul. But actually the experience of, of you could call it human life, but as you, as Prabhupada always talked about this, as you advance in Krishna consciousness, as you get back in touch with your spiritual body, it's really just you and your spiritual body acting through a, a human body. For example, let's say, for example, I had on a long sleeve shirt and gloves because of some, let's say, mental quirk. But let's say I came to give the class in a long sleeve shirt and gloves. And so let's say you actually couldn't see my arms or hands. I mean, all you saw. But still, as I was gesturing and everything, it would be me. It would be me gesturing, expressing myself through my own body, even though you could only see the covering of it. So, the reason why human life is natural, when you live it right, when you do it right, human life provides extraordinary happiness, satisfaction, enlightenment, love, if you do it right. And the reason it feels so natural is because it's really us doing all these things. It's the soul with the form inside the body. But that's our eternal form. So, uh, you, so you're saying that uh, Krishna has an objective form at all? Yeah, we're not just like misleading the public by putting these pictures on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and frankly, once you get, I mean, for, I was very lucky. I, I grew up in Los Angeles. If you look up Los Angeles in the database, like all Prabhupada's writings and statements, one of the main things he says about LA is it's really got good weather. I mean, it's, it's really true. I mean, we don't really have in L.A. like really a summer, like a, like a serious summer. Of course, neither does England, but there's no winter either. It's nice weather, and, you know, I, came, I was very fortunate. had a really, really good loving family. We lived in nice areas, and so, and so when I was in middle school, I don't, what do you say? You don't say middle school? Yeah, we do say middle school, say yeah. Middle school. Okay, let's go with middle school. So... You know, when I was in middle school, we started having parties. They were very innocent. I mean, it wasn't X-rated. It was just, you know, it was just like basically young people pretending they were older than they were. And, um, but, you know, it was great. Actually, it was really great because in those days, people didn't really do it, you know, at that age. And so, and so because there was a certain innocence. I remember that when all of your energy and feelings aren't just kind of like like, I don't know, just like splayed out into physicality, your emotions, your feelings, your affections, your loyalty get very deep. Precisely, you know, it's, it's like a river. When a river, if a river just, you know, comes to a place where it just becomes, spreads out, becomes very wide, it also goes very slowly. It has no energy. But when a river, let's say, goes into a canyon or a narrow valley where the water is forced onto a narrow path, that's when you get powerful water. That's when you get, you know, hydroelectric power. The river becomes very powerful. It's just like, to give another example, um, well, let's say the music of, uh, we'll take Handel, George Friedrich Handel, originally German, but became English, and one of the two greatest Baroque composers, along with Bach, J.S. Bach. And so, uh, in those days, they had certain rules, you know, certain concept of musicology. If you wanted to compose serious music, you had to follow certain rules. But precisely because they followed those rules, they, and, and, and it, was like, it was like the river kind of forced into this narrow place. It's so powerful. The emotions become so deep, so powerful because of the discipline. And so in the same way in relationships, 
when people are actually self-controlled and see each other as spiritual beings, not just as, you know, a, you know, some flesh to grab onto, but they actually see each other as souls, the emotions, the feelings, the affection becomes very, very deep. The trust, the loyalty becomes very deep. And so, um, so we were saying that, you know, I mean, Indian culture, for example, Indian culture, at least till now, has been a much more chaste culture in the sense of marriages and so on. And they're, and they're actually very deep feelings. So, um, so Krishna. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. It might sound a bit silly, but um, when you were saying children usually personify things, they draw little faces on. Um, so it's a reflection of a spiritual world because every everything in the spiritual world's got consciousness to them. Um, there's been a question that kept on tormenting me, but I never asked because I thought it's really silly. So if everything's got consciousness in the spiritual world, um, even the rocks, when we read Krishna book, they melt when Krishna is walking. <laughs> and um, I was just thinking, what about the fruits that Krishna is eating? Do they also have some kind of consciousness? How does it quite work? How does it feel to be eaten by Krishna? <laughs> 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 to be perfectly honest, that whole area of theology, like, okay, if a fruit, is it the tree that's a soul and gives the fruit, or is each fruit a soul? We don't typically have that information. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of spiritual teachers that uh, kind of just, you know, take a shot at it, or even say, yes, actually, mm -hmm. the spiritual. The real fact is uh, that information is not in the scriptures. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, I'm happy to find out when I get there, like, you know, walk up to an apple. Are you a person? <laughs> no, it's made of tree. <laughs> so I, I have to admit that I actually don't personally sleep over that stuff. <laughs> so you know, it'll, it'll all become clear soon. Though. I personally don't want to be a lemon or a even an apple. I, I like being a person. That, that's, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the point. I was making the point, and I, I was talking about my youth, and I got all lost in California weather. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, I had, I had a really happy childhood. I mean, you know, always, there's always problems, always little traumas in youth. But, and so we went to these parties, and we were innocent. And I have to say, because it was, kind of, it was a very innocent time, it was a very innocent time, but... You know, there were there were good looking boys, and there were pretty girls, and um, I think we really had we had real affection for each other. And so when I think back to that time, there was like real friendship between boys, girls, boys and girls. I mean there was there was real friendship, real loyalty, real affection, deep affection. And when I found out that hey, the spiritual world is just like the eternal middle school party. I thought, sign me up. <laughs> because, you know, when I think back to that time, I, I'm not allowed to say this in this con, but I was really happy. And, um, I, mean, I mean, obviously it wasn't ultimate spiritual happiness. We were just innocent, but... And I realized how what I experienced, say, into my teens and everything, uh you know, 14, 15, 16, all you know, the teenage years, and Krishna's sort of always 16, you know, sweet 16, kind of stays there. But the thing is, if it, it was just so magical when I was young, and, you know, falling in love with this person, and then falling in love with that person, but, but anyway, but, but it, it, it was so magical, and, and you know, it just, when I think back, I just think there was so much happiness, because we were innocent, we weren't sinful, you know, there were no drugs, and no, I'd never seen a drug. I mean, to the time I graduated high school, I'd never seen a drug. I had no idea what a drug looked like. And, and you know, people weren't sleeping around. And so, because of that innocence, there, there, but there was real affection, there were relationships. And then I think, well, imagine that, but infinitely better. <coughs> like, what if you take away all the material quality, you know, the envy, the frustration, the disappointment, the heartbreak, this, that. Take all that away. Take away the fact that all these beautiful young people can grow up into kind of like, you know, kind of materialistic, <laughs> overweight, overweight. 
And so, I mean, what if those bodies were eternal? I mean, for me, being young back there in L.A., going to these parties, and just having friends, and, you know, and seeing beautiful girls, and, and, and you know, the guys, it wasn't a problem having a human body. That was really not a problem for me. The problem was, it's temporary. The problem was we were, in one sense, deeply ignorant. We didn't really understand who we are. We didn't understand the soul. We didn't understand what true love is. And we felt, and, and so, if you take all the magic of being young, of falling in love, of having friends, of being, and if you think of 16 years old, I mean, Krishna chose wisely. <laughs> you know, I approve of Krishna's choice. Because if you think about it, when you're 16, you're old enough to really fall in love. A 60, you know, it's not like, like you know, being 11 years old and you go on some little kiddie date or something. You know, when you're 16 years old, you can really fall in love with someone. You can really love someone. And yet, you're not an adult. You don't do stupid things like go to work. <laughs> I mean, I'm not denigrating people who go to work. I'm just saying that, that when you're 16, and assuming you don't live in a, you know, a country in which you know children are forced to work in factories to produce consumer products for first world countries. So, but at sixteen, you can really fall in love. You're <coughs> old enough to really love someone and to and to really appreciate their love, and yet you're still a youth. You're still young, and you're still free. And, and so, um, and that's the age Christian is. So, based on my own life experience. The idea that there's there's an eternal world with Krishna, where you can just be young and fall in love, and in the spiritual world, actually souls have affinity. I mean, there are boys and girls that actually have a special attachment to each other. I mean, we must assume that Yashoda and Nanda like each other. It's like, hello, my name is Nanda. It says here that you're going to be my Leela wife. Hi, you must be Nanda. Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't really like each other that much. Let's just shake hands and let's just. You know, do this for Krishna. I mean, the point is that the point is that Nanda and Shoda must love each other. Otherwise, how could they live forever as husband and wife? And so, Radha and Krishna are the supreme conjugal pair. But it's not that it's illicit for another soul to fall in love with another soul. The point is that Krishna is always in the center. So, if you really do the math, as they say. You know, if you really look at what the spiritual world is, you know, you wouldn't want to go anywhere else. I mean, and you trade all of that, eternal love, be eternally youthful and in love and the singing and the dancing, just the inconceivable happiness and pleasure. No, I think I'd rather glow for all eternity in the drama, you know, the impersonal drama. I'll, I'll just, I think I'll just glow. You know, that's why, you know, uh, who is it? One of the followers of the Lord Chaitanya. Well, when the song says, goes on, it's Kai Valya Narakaya, that, uh, that impersonal liberation without the personal God is just like going to hell. So if you really think about Krishna, uh, you wouldn't want, once you really understand Krishna, become attached to Krishna, nothing else to do for you. You can't go back to an impersonal, faceless God. When you've got one that's infinitely beautiful. I mean, who's going to change, uh, trade infinite beauty for like a blank mask? Really? I mean, what if you were set up with a date? You know, like those blind dates, you know, and you, the person comes out and it's, oh my God, it's a blank face. Ooh, you know, it's like some kind of science fiction thing. Ooh. I mean, who wants a blank face? You want a beautiful face, right? What if you looked in the mirror? Oh my God, I became a blank face. It's... <laughs> I mean, get real. What we really want is we want to be beautiful. In Los Angeles, there's a huge cosmetic surgery industry, so... Anyway, so we want to be beautiful. We want to be surrounded by beauty. We want to love a beautiful person. We want a beautiful person to love us. We want to have all kinds of wonderful activities. We want beautiful nature you know, romantic life, we want to have friends, we want to be free. That's the spiritual world. I mean, everything we want is the spiritual world. 
Krishna actually knows how to design worlds. He's, he's really good at it. So it's not like, oh my God, Krishna, nice try. And you know, I, I fixed a few things here. <coughs> Here's someone with infinite consciousness and an infinite ability to give pleasure, infinite beauty, who's designed an infinite world. And no thanks. I think I'll rather uh, you know do something stupid. So, so if you think about Krishna, if you think about the personal form of Krishna, why would you want to give that away? What's the problem? What's the problem that God is a real person? It's like you can study political science. You can study, for example, the British parliamentary system. There's a prime minister. There's you know there's this that. Well, that's a bad example in England right now because of the situation you're in. But okay. Let's say you studied, let's go to France. It's a little too complicated here. Let's say, let's say you go to France and, and you study the political system in France. There's a president in France and a prime minister. But the point is, someone is the president. There's not just the office of president. You can study political science or prime minister or this minister or that minister. These positions are not merely empty positions. Someone some specific person actually is the Prime Minister. So in the same way, you can talk about God, but ultimately, someone actually is God. Right? I mean, it's not that, no, it's just an eternal category. Someone actually is God. And would you rather that person just be like, blank, like a ghost, or be beautiful? I mean, why would you want God to be beautiful? So, uh, Krishna, the vote for Krishna is a vote for theological sanity. <laughs> yes. Okay, we're going to end here. Sanskrit, Tatsarvam Janaha, which means, that's all folks. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare. Sorry to be the party pooper. <laughs> I could have sat here listening to you all night, but unfortunately, um, we do have to carry on. Um, so anyway, we just wanted to say thank you so much to Maharaj. It was really inspiring to hear. I liked many of the analogies you gave. I liked the one about Skype, that we're not just mad, we're talking to the computer screen, but someone's on the other side. That was a really nice analogy. And um, I was thinking, you know, one of the best ways that we talk to Krishna is uh, through chanting his holy names. So um, in a moment we're going to serve Prashad, but I thought it's nice to finish with a little bit of chanting, just maybe for 10 minutes while we get everything ready for Prashad. I hope you're already hungry. Put your hands up if you're hungry. Okay, we're going to make you sing for your supper now. <laughs> so I'd like to ask Maharaj, would you like to chant Hare Krishna? Sure. So we'll, yeah, about 10 minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll serve Prashad.